things off, Congressman Kennedy, you've gone to some very prestigious universities. So which one do you rate better, Harvard or Stanford? <laughs> look at you, right away. Um, look, I, um, I, so they were both uh, extraordinary experiences for me. Um, I think most people would say without question, college is probably a more enjoyable experience than law school. <laughs> and I certainly would say that. So. Um, what place did I enjoy more? I, I enjoyed my time in, at uh, Stanford probably more than I enjoyed uh, my time at, in law school at Harvard, but um, without question, the uh, legal training and the academic experience at, um, at law school was an extraordinary gift. Um, but it was an awful lot harder than yeah. four years of college. Enjoy your time when you guys get there. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great place, right? And a great time in your life, too. After you graduated Stanford, you yeah. spent two years in the Dominican Republic as a yeah. member of the Peace Corps. So can you tell us more about your experiences there? Yeah, so um, the Peace Corps, for, for folks that don't know, is a uh, volunteer organization um, sponsored by the United States government that um, has been operating for about 50 or so years, um, longer than that now. Um, and the goal on it is to um, provide opportunities for um, a broad swath of American citizens. So um, a lot of folks are younger people straight out of college, but the oldest volunteers are actually in their 70s. But to go back and serve their country by volunteering in communities of need um, overseas. And there's literally dozens and dozens of, of countries that have requested that help from the United States. I spent about two and a half years in the Dominican Republic, and I loved it. Um, there's not a day that goes by that I don't draw on that experience um, in some way. And I can tell you without question that I would not be sitting here before you as uh, a member of Congress if not for that experience. Um, it got me well outside my comfort zone. It got me to see the world a bit differently. Um, you see the, the consequences of what happens when uh, government works and when it doesn't, when it, um, the challenges that people confront when um, they're not in a position to, or their, their ability to influence their uh, the trajectory of their own pathway is, is limited. Um, and you see what happens when there's not really a safety net there to catch people, when there's not a healthcare system to fall back on, um, when the education system doesn't actually make that guarantee that every child's going to have a chance to succeed. Um, and so um, it, it was a, a huge, had a huge impact on my life. Um, as with anything that's that difficult, it doesn't mean you love every moment. I didn't, but looking back on the experience there, um, it's certainly one that I, uh, I hold quite dearly. That's wonderful. So in <coughs> this Gurdwara, yeah. there are many people here are immigrants or children of immigrants. So that's an issue which is very close to the hearts of this community. So can you please uh, explain to us your compassionate immigration policy and why that's so important to you? Yeah, look, so uh, I think a, a critical question for for this time, um, I think a critical question for uh, a Sikh community, but a critical question for our country. Because um, our country's story at its core is in fact, um, or should be, an immigrant story. Both of my uh, lines of my, my family, my mother's side and my father's, immigrated here to this country, albeit uh, a long time apart. But, um, Believing in the promise of this country, my mother's side for religious freedom, my father's side fleeing famine in Ireland um, many, many years ago. And um, I consider myself the, um, an example of an immigrant story. Um, and what happens when you have a country that doesn't necessarily make it easy for an immigrant community, this country doesn't but that recognizes the contributions that an immigrant community can make to the foundation, the building blocks, and the success of a nation. And so when I see the actions of this administration uh, and condoned essentially by um, a Republican Party in the House and the Senate, um, it's awfully hard to justify. And it's one of the reasons why I've been down to the border and uh, the southern border a number of times, um, participated in demonstrations and protests there, visited the Customs and Border Patrol facilities, have showed up at Logan Airport protesting there, um, a Muslim ban and amongst other um, acts um, and, and policies put forth by this administration. 
worked with lawyers and advocates to, on an individual case by case basis to try to make sure that um, that folks have been caught up in the the mess put forward by this um, by this administration that the laws are in fact followed and the rights they are available of their rights. Um, because I believe deeply in the contribution that an immigrant community can make here. Um, because I've seen that through my own family. And um, I'm proud of their contribution. And I think this country should be extremely proud of the fact that, that people from all over the world still want to come here. And we should be terrified of the, fa of the, the time when they don't, not the time when they do. All right, um, so thank you for that. Um, you are a member of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, and as a member, you are pushing to get the United States to re-enter the Paris Agreement. Yes. So can you tell us about why this is important? So this is important because I want to make sure there's a planet for me to enjoy and for you guys to enjoy. And I've got a two-year-old and a four-year-old. I want to make sure they're able to enjoy it too. And the fact is that the climate change is real. The United States, our government, can do something about it, and we haven't. And we haven't for a really long time. The, the last major piece of climate policy that was passed by Congress, signed into law by the president, happened under Richard Nixon. Right? Under Richard Nixon when he passed the Clean Air Act. It's been well over 40 years since that happened. And you just can't wait any longer. So yes, Paris is a, a critically important part of this, but it's also why you gotta go far beyond to signing on to a, uh, an international obligation. We've got to make that real. You've got to make those, those changes, those investments here in the United States now. We needed to make them decades ago. But you've got to do it now. You've got to change the fundamental framework of our economy that accounts for the fact that pollution is a subsidy. Somebody is damaging, somebody is inflicting a cost on others and not having to pay for it. And you need to make sure that they're paying for it. We need to make sure that people are held accountable for this. And we got to, um, that's going to, necessitate a fundamental shift in the way that we go about um, the, the framework to our economy. It's kind of what is outlined in, this, uh, in the idea of a Green New Deal, which I support. And now we've got to put our committees working on putting meat on the bones as to what that actually means, not just the important aspirational goals there, but how you actually lay that out in policy and what is it going to take to build the political coalitions necessary to bring it across the finish line. That's very, true. that's very true. You know, it's never too soon to. to it's to never too soon to ensure that your kids have a planet. <laughs> right? I mean, but that's what this is about, right? Like, you, you can't, you can't look at what is taking place today, whether it's forest fires across California or fires that envelop m much of Australia, storms that are supposed to be once every hundred years and now result in flooding almost on a weekly basis somewhere across our country changing migration patterns, fishing patterns, etc., and not also recognize that there is a cost to doing nothing. We are seeing that cost today. You hear plenty of folks say, well, it's shifting us off of X, Y, or Z, or making these investments cost something. There's a huge cost to not doing anything, and we have to recognize that too. All right, well, thank you so much for talking with us, and good luck in your run for Senate. Thank you. I'll need thank it. Very much. Make sure everybody votes, <laughs> if you can. If you're, are you guys old enough to vote? No. <laughs> but when you are, vote. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks.